forest had the right name for the mountain all along. Hundreds of years ago, long before an English explorer penned the name of a British diplomat to the peak, the Indians called Mount St. Helens the Smoking Mountain. From the forested river valleys, the mountain rose past the jewel of Spirit Lake and soared on to a snowy peak almost 9,700 feet high. For those who came each year to climb, to wander, to camp, to dream, St. Helens was a painting come to life. Some called it the Fujiyama of America for its symmetry and rocky grace. Then, on a morning in May, it all blew away with a force 500 times that of the atom bomb which leveled Hiroshima. The mountain blew its top. Clouds of searing ash and debris swept down its slopes, toppling trees like matchsticks, boiling creeks dry, trapping, killing dozens of people and hundreds of animals in its firestorm. The mountain unleashed torrents of mud and debris. It drowned river valleys and dashed the homes, the dreams of those who had lived in its shadow. It changed the face of Western Washington forever. From this to this. From this to this. For years, geologists had watched the mountain. They had labeled St. Helens an especially dangerous volcano, one that had been more active, more explosive, than any other on the mainland U.S. Yet its fury came as a surprise. The mountain is young by the measure we take of ancient Earth. This volcano and its ancestors on whose ashes it rose date back only 37,000 years. Most of what was the mountain before its spasm of destruction in May was only 2,500 years old. Its violent temper is the heart of many Indian legends. They say the Great Spirit once gave the land north of the Columbia River to one brave. The land to the south was the domain of another warrior. The two fell in love with the same beautiful maiden. She could not decide what she preferred. The braves battled for her love, hurling fire and hot rocks at each other across the Columbia. That angered the great spirit, who in a rage turned one brave into Washington's Mount Adams, the other into Oregon's Mount Hood, and the lovely maiden into Mount St. Helens. That is the stuff of legend. So too is the life of mountain innkeeper Harry Truman. He spent half a century at his lodge on Spirit Lake in the shadow of Mount St. Helens, a mountain he loved and protected. It's, it's an emblem of me that Bam Sign's been there 50 some years. What if you took it down? Well, I'm not going to take it down. Nobody's going to take it down or take me down in a wooden kimono down that road, ass backwards when I go down that road or I'm not leaving. And I'm not going to take my name off of that sign that's sandblasted. I've changed it five times in my life and it's going to sit there and let rots down. And by God, I'd like to see the man that's going to take that sign off that, that post. It is Thursday, March 20th, 1980. The last people to witness the volcano's power had seen her erupt in 1857. Since then, the mountain has been quiet. Now, an earthquake rumbles deep inside St. Helens. She is awakening after a 123-year slumber. Police and scientists scramble. You're gonna have to go, and the faster the better. One time, one thing, you gotta go. Two minutes and it occurred about 
three minutes ago. For seven days, quakes jolt the mountain. By the end of that week, the ground around the peak trembles constantly as swarms of quakes rock St. Helens. March 27th, 12.30 p.m., an explosion from the summit as steam blasts a crater in the glacial ice. Throughout the night, more explosions enlarge the crater. Rocks and steam rocket into the air. By mid-morning the next day, a second crater appears. Snowfield. The blasts continue, and the two craters become one, almost a half mile long and 500 feet deep. There is ash now mixed with the steam. April 3rd, two weeks after the first earthquake, a new kind of tremor rolls through the mountain. The scientists call it a harmonic tremor. For the first time, it signals molten rock is on the move, deep within the mountain. For three weeks, the volcano spits ash and steam. There are thousands of small earthquakes. There is no major eruption. There are no fireworks. But the watchers come from across the country and around the world, hoping they will be the ones to see the fury, if it comes. I just want to see volcano at work. Um, I don't. I don't even know if it's, I don't think it's going to blow at this point. I think it's just going to sit and simmer. Overworked and undermanned, the police try to keep sightseers out of the area. They try too to keep residents away from an uncertain danger. I have about seven thousand dollars worth of snowmobiles at my cabin and at my film site. Okay. Under my own responsibility, and I go up and get them. Hey, we wouldn't be in there ten minutes. I know, but that, that's, that's all the longer it takes us to go in there is about ten minutes and get the hell out. Have been over here? At this point. The volcano is still a novelty, a curious smoking reminder of our primitive past. There is no hint of a deadly future. He's staying, huh? He, Harry's gonna stay. It's his choice. There's no goddamn way that that mountain hasn't got enough stuff to come my way. I've got a hill and trees there between me and that. No way in the world to do it. Wednesday, April 30th, the north slope of the mountain begins to bulge, to tilt ever so slightly. Scientists worry. Geologists say molten rock may be forcing its way up inside the mountain. They watch and wait. Then, the mountain quiets down in May. Many of the spectators pack up and leave. So do some of the scientists, thinking the volcano may belch and spit off and on for months or years. Saturday, May 17th, sheriff's deputies allow 50 people into the area around Spirit Lake to check their homes and property and pack out belongings. This house has been here 100 years. I collect things. 
This house is just full. My daughter's helping me. My daughter's the one's having a fit because all this junk I got. She doesn't want it to live. She wants to live. inherit it, I guess. How long have you lived? 11 years. This was my grandfather's house, and I'm renting. I was waiting to buy it. That evening, the little caravan leaves the mountain. But crusty old Harry Truman remains, scoffing at those who go. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. If I left, it'd kill me. If I left this place and lost my home, I'd die in a week. I, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I couldn't extend it. So I'm like that old captain, and by God, I'm going down the ship. I said, if the damn thing takes this mountain, I'm going along with it. I'd rather be dead for her than to live without it. Sunday morning, May 18th. It is 8.32. An explosion with the force of a 10 megaton atomic bomb rips off the north face of Mount St. Helens. The top 1,200 feet of the mountain disintegrate. Hurricane force wind flattened trees up to 12 miles from the summit. It is the leading edge of the path of death to come. One minute later, lightning storms begin. They spark blazes around the mountain. A fiery avalanche of volcanic gas, debris, and ash surges down the gaping hole in the north side of St. Helens, smothering everything in its path. Spirit Lake Lodge, Harry Truman, even the lake itself are all gone. Ash billows out of the crater, boiling 9, 10, 11 miles into the sky. The wind blows the black cloud to the north and east. In central and eastern Washington, day becomes night. The ash, like a snowfall, blankets the earth. has a hunch. 
a premonition something is going to happen on the mountain. Sunday morning, he watches his premonition come true as he films at the foot of the exploding peak. Suddenly, he is trapped in hell. The wind howls through the forest around him. A road disintegrates in front of his car. There is no way out. As the ash cloud comes after him, Crockett turns on his camera and talks into the microphone, knowing these words will be his last. Oh, dear God, whoever finds this, I don't know. Oh, you can't see this. I'm sure it's, it's too dark. I've left the car behind. The rest of the gear, we got one magazine. And as you can tell probably from this picture, I'm walking towards the only light I can see on top of a ridge. I can hear the mountain behind me rumbling. It's an enormous mud and water, so I came down and washed out the road. I never really thought I'd believe this or, or say this, but at this moment, I honest to God believe I'm dead. There's really no, no way to describe those feelings. I feel the ash now in my eyes. It's getting very hard to breathe. Burnt to breathe. Because I'm going to be able to talk. It burns to breathe. It burns my eyes. Oh, dear God. My God, this is hell. I just can't describe it. It's pitch black. Just pitch black. This is, this is hell on earth I'm walking through. Oh, God. Just one step at a time, if I can just keep walking. God, if I can land, there's more air to breathe. Well, it's been about 10 minutes. It's now totally pitch black. I can't see to keep on walking. I guess I'm just going to have to sit down here and wait it out. God, I pray to God that's all I'm doing is sitting here waiting it out. Dear God, it's very, very hard to breathe in this. I can't see a thing. If only I could keep walking, you know, only if I could do something. If only I could do something, you know. So it's just sitting here. <laughs> yeah, I got the wrong attitude here. I mean, this would be something to tell my grandchildren about. <laughs> Oh, man. Ten hours later, a Coast Guard helicopter rescues Dave Crockett from his personal hell. He will live to tell his grandchildren about Sunday morning, May 18th, 1980. 11.15 a.m. Snow and ice melted in the inferno that scorched the mountain, rushed down its slopes, gathering trees, rocks, and power along the way. These mammoth mud flows sweep down both forks of the Tudor River, killing sightseers, ripping apart a dozen bridges, demolishing homes, cars, and logging rigs.
Sunday afternoon. The mud flows reach Interstate 5, more than 30 miles from St. Helens. They threaten to slice through the bridges there and cut the major north-south route between Seattle and Portland. The bridges hold. The muddy torrent churns toward the Columbia. It chokes the mighty river with silt and strands two dozen ships. Monday, May 19th. Most of the mountain's fury is spent. The face of Mount St. Helens has changed forever. A horseshoe-shaped crater where the summit once stood. 150 square miles of forest and valley are gone. choked sulfurous wasteland of hot mud. begin to dig out. The cloud of gray grit moves slowly eastward on the jet stream currents, 10 miles above the earth. By week's end, it will reach the Atlantic Ocean, then circle the earth. May 21st, four days after the explosion, a shaken President Carter promises federal help and then tours the devastation. seen or heard of anything like this before. Somebody said it looked like a moonscape, mm -hmm. but the moon looks like a golf course compared to uh, <laughs> compared to what's up there. This, it is a horrible looking sight. hovers over what once was Spirit Lake. Inside is Jerry Whiting. She is Harry Truman's sister. The chopper touches down lightly on the cracked, desolate moonscape. There is no longer any hope that Harry Truman survived. Jerry is saying goodbye. Goodbye to her brother, killed by the mountain that for half a century gave him life. The mountain has taken so much in such a short time. Lives, jobs, homes, a way of life. A special place so many thought would always be with us. All are gone. Destroyed in that instant on Sunday morning. Yet one end marks another beginning. Already seedlings sprout through the ash. Animals return cautiously. Man cleans up to build again. 
the mountain starts to rebuild itself. One moment in our passage through time is gone. Another has begun. <laughs> 